of worship here at First Christian Church of Reading. As we prepare to worship together, a few reminders that if you want to have communion with us later in the service, please have some type of food and drink handy as symbols for the bread and the cup which Christ incorporates in the Last Supper. Also, if you are watching live, a prayer concern should be sent now via Facebook chat or my cell phone number so that we can include them later on in the service. You can help us spread the word to those who cannot access this time of worship online that we now have a new resource that can be used via your land phone or cell phone line. Uh, it doesn't matter which phone you use. Starting as early as this afternoon, with uh, this morning service being recorded, the special music and sermon will be available to be listened to on the phone by calling a specialized phone number that is designated just for our church through the resource entitled Sermon by Phone. Every Sunday afternoon and through the entire week, people can call in to hear the message and music. To, so it, it's help us spread the word uh, about this new resource. And we have sent letters out to people that we are aware of do not have internet access. But you may know of someone that might benefit from it. And we hope that you will help us uh, let folks know that they can enjoy the music and hear a word from scripture. Uh, every week through this new, new resource. Uh, the phone number can be found in our church newsletter. If you are not receiving our monthly newsletter, it is really easy to sign on to get it. Just send us your email and we will be happy to add you to our email list and rest assured your email doesn't get shared with anyone you do not want it to be shared with. For those without email, we will send out uh, via post office um, the newsletter to you if you would like to give us your address. Uh, it was mailed out Friday for those of you on the list, so if you want a copy, be sure and let us know via our website, Facebook page, email, or calling us at 530-242-1589. Our second service will not meet again today, unfortunately, due to the rain, which we do ne desperately need in our area. So we are not upset about the rain, but we do miss seeing each other's faces. We hope to meet next Sunday, weather permitting at 1115 on the patio outdoors, masks required. The elders will be meeting next Sunday at 1040 a.m. in the sanctuary, masked and socially distanced. A new orientation and training will be held for our brand new elders. And so we hope our elders will plan to be present next Sunday at 1040 a.m. If there are no other announcements, then I invite you to make yourself comfortable wherever you are and take a deep breath and allow God's presence to surround you and let us be in a spirit of worship as we listen to the prelude.
Christ meets you where you are, calling you to become disciples of God's ways. Come follow the Lord of life. God meets you where you are, calling you to leave your nets and become fishers of God's children. Come follow the Lord of life. Come praise the one who calls us, who leads us, who loves us, and who saves us. Christ our Lord, let us pray. Gracious God, you spoke through your son Jesus to the fishermen to follow in his footsteps. You called to them to help create a world where peace and justice reign where the broken are mended and the sick are healed. Speak now to us that we will be touched by your love and changed by your grace. Equip us to be your servants as we unite with your will for this earth. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Our first song is God of grace and God of glory. Let us sing together. We value the gift of prayer and the ability to come together and share what weighs upon our hearts and our spirits. And in this time, we invite you, if you have not done so, to send prayer concerns via the chat line. If you are watching this as a recorded message, then feel free to drop us a note on our website and we will add you to our prayer chain during the week. Please keep in your prayers this day. Celeste H. had surgery in Santa Rosa and was released from the hospital yesterday. She is doing well and grateful for a successful surgery. 
Jim G has been diagnosed with COVID, unfortunately. Uh, he is now in the COVID wing at Shasta Regional. Please keep him and wife Linda in your prayers and the whole family as they go through this difficult time. Sandy C's son, Kelly, is at Shasta Regional and was having severe pain. Uh, pray for Kelly as well as uh, Sandy as she is very concerned for her son. Glenn C is, uh, was having tests for digestive issues. Uh, keep him in your prayers as well as the doctors as they make important decisions. Elsa C is uh, going, has been diagnosed uh, with uh, needing to see a neurologist for the numbness that is her in her extremities. Uh, might be related to uh, migraines, but still unsure. Sure, so she's going to a neurologist. Jerry S. is at Vibra, and Jan B. is at Marquis. Prayers are needed for both of them as they go through physical therapy. We pray for all of our health professionals in this pandemic world, uh, for Aaron, Caroline, and Romer, for Teresa and Kate, for Jen, a viewer online, and Jen also asks for prayers for fiance Rob and her son. We pray for those who have had their vaccines and for those who are anxiously waiting. Particularly grateful that Stan and Joan S. and folks at Veterans Home as well as Marion B. Uh, at Oakmont have received their first shots. We are grateful that our folks living in uh, close quarters across our community are beginning to get their shots. Uh, we pray for all of those who have, are battling COVID and we especially pray this day aware that uh, we're, many of us are losing patience with the situation and the struggles that a new variant are bringing on uh, that seems to be uh, uh, more contagious and we want to be aware of everyone who is uh, still on the front lines battling this issue and for wisdom for all people uh, as we look to uh, the future when prayerfully everyone can get vaccinated and we will be safe. Are there other concerns or celebrations for our church family? Jennifer T says praise, pray for the judge uh, for future court to have a kind and understanding heart that she recognizes that the change in healing is being done and that she reunites the family. Okay. Are there others? If not, I invite you to breathe deeply and allow yourself to sense God's presence in and around you and let us be in a spirit of prayer. A miraculous and loving God, hear the thoughts of our many minds across this world near and far. Some of us are hurt and ask for healing some are confused and seek direction. Some are lonely and cry out for companionship. Some are compassionate and offer petitions for others. Some are merely grateful to be worshiping you. While others are not exactly sure what to say to you in a time like this. Gather us all up with our many thoughts and voices into a sense of your holy presence. Transform us into followers of your way, into a living, breathing reflection of Christ. May the health of those who are healthy flow into the lives of those who are not. May the spirit of love, hope, and positivity come upon those who have grown cynical and negative. And let generous and gracious energy blow in and around those who have become self-centered and singular in their vision. Remind us of our need for you, that we were not meant to journey through life without you by our side. 
Help us surrender our hearts and minds to your will. Teach us anew the mission of your son that we might carry it forward in this time. Create a new atmosphere in us and our community for following in his footsteps, for showing concern and action on behalf of the poor, for speaking up for those who feel they have no voice, for working to bring justice and equity to all people. Make us into thankful and responsive creatures as we join our thoughts together in the prayer that Jesus prayed with his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We welcome Stan and Pauline to share with us in special music. Here comes God's kingdom. 
Change your heart to lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat, repairing the fishing net. At that very moment, he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. Thank you, Alice. <clears throat> So a recent survey came out from Pew Research Center this week indicating that one in four Americans report a significant increase in their faith during these COVID days. The health crisis has apparently led some to reevaluate and question the priorities in their lives and how they live their lives. We used to call this self-questioning a midlife crisis, but I prefer to talk of it as a second journey into life. Imagine a hedge fund investor piles up an impressive portfolio of dollars and honors, gets his name in Forbes magazine, is ready to make a ton of money off of the failing GameStop retail store, and then wakes up one morning asking, is it all worth it? More than ever before, competent teachers, nurses, and clergy can reach the top only to discover that their job no longer fascinates them. They find themselves terrified of stagnation and ask, should I switch careers? Would returning to school help? Gail Sheehy, well-known author, began her second journey at 35 years old when she was covering a story in Northern Ireland. She was standing next to a young man when a bullet blew off his face. On that bloody Sunday, she came face to face with death and with what she called the arithmetic of life. She realized, no one is with me. No one keeps me safe. There is no one who won't ever leave me alone. That day threw her completely off balance and flung at her a barrage of painful questions about her ultimate purpose and values. In those moments, she was ripe to begin a second journey. Today's gospel story does not reveal any such obvious crisis. Yet four fishermen likewise began their own second journeys. Their life circumstances seem to indicate to us uh, that Simon and Andrew were probably very poor because Mark makes no mention of a boat of their own. They cast their nets from the shallows of the sea and sort their catch on the beach by themselves. On the other hand, James and John probably had more to walk away from, as their story includes a boat, some hired men, and their father Zebedee. But rich or poor, both sets of brothers turned away from all the familiar aspects of their lives in order to go after a stranger who called them to follow. Now, if we research archaeological and historical documents surrounding that time and location, we discover that the Sea of Galilee, from which they were fishing, is the lowest freshwater lake on earth which makes it very prone to violent and sudden storms. Therefore, fishing was a very dangerous business there, but it was also the prime moneymaker for all the towns around the lake. 
The fish industry was being restructured at the time to accommodate more exports. So the majority of fish were salt preserved or made into this fish sauce and were shipped off to distant markets. All fishing had become state regulated at that time for the benefit of the urban elite. Both Greeks and Romans who had settled in Palestine as well as Jews who aligned themselves with King Herod's family profited from the fishing industry. First, they controlled the fish licenses, the sale of fishing leases is what they were called, which without the locals could not even begin to fish. These rights were normally awarded not to individuals, but to local kinship based corporatives like the brothers Simon and Andrew or the Zebedee family. Second, those in power taxed the fish product and its processing and levied tolls on product transport. The result was that the formerly self-sufficient native fishing families became marginalized and fishermen fell to the bottom of an increasingly elaborate economic hierarchy. Roman poet Cicero reflects the perspective of the elites as he writes, the most shameful occupations are those which cater to our sensual pleasures, such as fish sellers, butchers, cooks, poultry raisers, and fishermen. Our gospel story doesn't overtly point to a crisis crisis at hand, but clearly the fishermen in our story are being exploited and oppressed by the influencers, the rich, the privileged, who keep their feet planted firmly on the necks of these folks. So were the fishermen looking for a second journey in life? If so, Mark doesn't say, but instead keeps the focus on Jesus and his immediate mission. You see, things happen quickly in the Gospel of Mark, whose favorite word for transitioning between story after story is to use the word immediately. There is no time for backstories in this Gospel, because as Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. You see, Mark was the first Gospel written. And the author is concerned about quickly getting that news out about Jesus. The problem is we have taken this story of immediacy whose focus is on Jesus and his mission, and we have made it a story about the fishermen, how they were heroes to drop everything and just go. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that take on this story, but I believe it misses the complete point. The story is not about the delusion that we can, by our own good decisions and good deeds, save ourselves. It is not about the idea if we just work hard enough, if we pray hard enough, if we give enough, then life's second journey will be a success and God will finally claim us as Christ's disciples. This belief actually is a form of idolatry, making it all about us which probably stems from that phrase we may have all heard growing up, God helps those who help themselves. Incidentally, that's nowhere in the Bible. Just try looking it up. The fact that the fishermen went along with Jesus is a strange twist to be sure. But Mark would not have us dwell on what strength and courage these four fishermen had According to the author, there was nothing hard about it at all. Jesus called and they followed, period. They did not know him, nor were they waiting to be rescued from their circumstances. They probably didn't even describe themselves as religious, but they took one look at him and that was that. No torn hearts, no backward glances. They just dropped what was in their hands and went after Jesus without saying a word. It was not 
as much as if they decided something. It was more like something happened to them. Something almost mysterious and sacred beyond explanation. For this reason, Barbara Brown Taylor asserts that this is not a hero story, but it is a miracle story. As full of God's power as the feeding of the 5,000 or the raising of the dead. Just listen to the language of miracle stories in Mark. Chapter 1, verse 41 says, Jesus said to the leper, be made clean. And immediately he was made clean. Chapter 2, verse 11, Jesus says to the paralyzed man, stand up, take your mat and go to your home. And the man stood up and immediately took his mat and went home. Again and again, the pattern continues. Follow me, Jesus says, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Do you hear it? This is no story about the courage of human beings to change their lives, to leave everything behind, to go off into the unknown, as worthy as those ideals might be. This is a story about the power of God to walk right up to a quartet of fishermen and work a miracle, creating faith where there was no faith, creating disciples where there were none just a moment ago, instilling hope for a new tomorrow when oppression, poverty, and yes, even a pandemic have squeezed the very breath out of life. This is not a story about us as much as it is a story about God and God's ability not only to call us out of our circumstances, but also to create us into people who are able to follow. God makes us into followers because we can't take our eyes off the one who calls us because the one who calls us interests us far more than anything else in our lives. With such a calling and an interest in the one who calls, we naturally would seek to follow Jesus' original intent and mission on earth. Scholar Chad, Chad Myers helps us reclaim that original mission. He asserts that Mark's inclusion of the phrase, follow me and I will make you fishers of people, invites listeners to remember the circumstances in which the fishermen were living. They indeed have been marginalized by society, victims of the rich and powerful in Israel. The metaphor of fishing relates back to the Hebrew scriptures, where in Jeremiah, it symbolizes God's disapproval of Israel. And in Amos and Ezekiel, catching fish with hooks was actually used to represent divine judgment on the rich and the powerful. So Jesus, as God's teacher who relied heavily on Hebrew scriptures, invites the four to become fishers of people, thereby inviting these common fishermen to join him in the struggle to overturn the existing social order of power and privilege. When Jesus says here, follow me, he is not inviting people to drop everything and leave this hostile world to go to some other world, but he's inviting you and I to partner with him in changing this world in such a way that it will cease to be hostile and unjust. As fishers of people, these four fishermen learned to hold accountable those who would use power and privilege selfishly. And they would learn to uplift those who had been broken by this world. Thus, the story remains as intended, not a story about how we can earn a place as Christ's disciples, but a story about Jesus's mission to transform the world to reflect the kingdom of God. That, my friends, is our calling. And maybe even the second journey 
we undertake in this life. Yeah, those four fishermen gave up a lot. That's not in question. But to stress that aspect of the story is to put the accent on the wrong syllable. Their minds were not on what they were leaving, but on whom they were joining. Their heads didn't cleave to what was following from, falling from their hands, but to what they were reaching out to find. And in that amazing God-drenched moment, the miracle occurred. Their wills were not two, three, or four, but one will. Their lives flowed in the same direction as Christ's. Time was fulfilled as the kingdom came and comes. Every time our lives are brought into that same flow as Christ's. As we become fishers of people, lovers of justice, and advocates for a more peaceful world. May it be so. Thanks be to God. We unite together in singing a song of affirmation to God's call on our lives. Here I am, Lord.
Uh, Janet, as I heard you talking about the exploitation of the poor in Jesus' time, I thought you were talking about what's happening right now in the United States. It seems like the exploitation of people has been in existence for quite a little while. In the Revised Standard Version, the scripture that was read this morning reads, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Perhaps it is a delusion, but I labor under the delusion that as God created the universe and created the human race, along with that was created the kingdom of God. Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden, which is another word for saying God placed Adam and Eve in his kingdom. They destroyed that kingdom through selfishness and greed. They became so self-centered that the human race simply could not get along with each other. We see glimpses throughout the Old Testament, primarily in the prophets and the Psalms, where individuals attempted to bring the people back to God's kingdom to help them understand that their relationship with one another depended more on forgiveness, on understanding, on compassion and helpfulness than upon self-interest. But as human beings, we tend to be very self-interested and all of us have grown up in a society that is very selfish, dedicated to self-interest, which results in a lot of injury and harm to other people. Sometimes we don't see that. Jesus pronounced the good news of the kingdom of God. And we have made the mistake of putting that in something that's going to happen in the future. Perhaps when Jesus comes again. No. It's something that has always been in existence in the beginning of creation. But as human beings, instead of choosing to be helpful and kind and compassionate to each other, we have concentrated on what we can accumulate for ourselves and to hell with anybody else. That self-interest is reflected in two ways in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You all remember that, the Samaritan is going along, found this man that was injured, helped him, took him, put him in a motel so he could get better. And Jesus used this as an example of how we should treat each other. But think for a moment of what we call it, the parable of the good Samaritan, which says this Samaritan was good, but all the other Samaritans are bad. We do this to each other. And God has called us to be kind, to be compassionate, to be helpful, to be thoughtful, and to recognize that we cannot live an effective life without each other. We need one another. I need you and you need me, even though we are all imperfect and we all make mistakes. The kingdom of God is right there within reach for each one of us, and we need to participate. I am thankful that this congregation tries very hard to participate in building that kingdom. We support so many outreach programs which are helpful to people. 
And this needs to be our goal. We continue to have to help by reaching out to one another. Obviously, building this kingdom requires that we finance things. Food for the poor does not come free. Having a house where we can worship is not free. We each one make our contribution. Those of you who are here can make a contribution in the baskets on the table. Those who are watching this on their computers can mail a check to Post Office Box 993741, Reading, California, 96099. We all are called to participate in the building of God's kingdom. At this time, I would like everyone that's here and those who are watching may go and gather the elements for the communion service. Our communion table here in the sanctuary has words. We participate in this service remembering Jesus. Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself in the building of God's kingdom. Each one of us are called upon to make sacrifices to work patiently with each other, to work with understanding, because God has reached out to us in love. The bread, we all too often take for granted. If you had to make bread from scratch by going to the store and buying the wheat, and grinding it and making flour and putting it all together to bake bread, you would begin to realize how valuable that is. And also the cup. It's not a simple matter simply to open a bottle and have grape juice. Someone has to gather those grapes and ferment them and make it possible to drink this bread and this drink represent life and has been given to us by God. Jesus reminds us of this. Thus, as we receive the bread and the cup, we are reminding ourselves of the sacrifice that Jesus made, but also of the life that God has given to us in his kingdom. Shall we participate? Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for the love that you have shown for us, for the patience you have with us. Teach us your way. Help us to follow Jesus as our Lord. May we reach out to each other in love, with compassion and understanding. Help us 
and strengthen us as we attempt to build your kingdom for the benefit of all people. Amen. Congregation, we are grateful that you chose to be in worship with us this day. I want to invite you uh, as a way to contribute to the community at large in this faith, play, uh, faith tradition here. If you are willing to take a picture of yourself or maybe your family or your home or something special at your home and email it to us. We would love to include it in our PowerPoint uh, that we do during the uh, conclusion of the service. So please uh, take a moment to take a picture and email it to the church. Uh, we look forward to seeing some of life at your place. You see some life here. We would love to see some life where you are. So please uh, help us to extend the table uh, to your place. Uh, we look forward to seeing that. <clears throat> I, I, one of the things that occurred to me is that uh, I might take a picture of my dining room table, which is uh, covered with puzzle pieces, because that's what Michaela does, is work on puzzles. Um, just uh, think about what uh, about uh, your life in COVID days that you could share with us in this time. And now, dear friends, as we prepare to conclude this time of worship, a reminder that Christ calls you and Christ calls me, young and old, near and far, for the time has been fulfilled. The kingdom comes every time our lives are brought into that same flow with Christ and we walk in the footsteps of Christ. So go to become fishers of people, lovers of justice and advocates for a more peaceful world by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>